Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Imagine that today we will visit a Hollywood movie studio where they shoot the best movies in the world of different genres. But instead of a movie pavilion, we will find ourselves in Wilbur, Nebraska, and our movie for today is a bloody thriller. Nebraska is the territory of the Great Plains. It is located in Tornado Alley. In spring and summer, there are often severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Nebraska is the only tri-state that is landlocked, which means to get from Nebraska to the ocean, bay or bay, you have to cross three states. Passing motorists don't like to stop on a dark country road. But a flat tire forced Michael to make a stop on a remote dark highway. He pulled over to the side of the road and got out of the car. As he walked around the car, his attention was drawn to a large black bag, the kind used for throwing out garbage, but the bag had an unusual shape. Michael returned to the car, took a flashlight from the glove compartment and illuminated the bag. It was torn open. There was a stain on the ground around it. Something had leaked out of it, and something light-colored was flickering out of the holes. Moving closer, the man froze at what he saw. A human hand was sticking out of the bag. A call to the emergency services raised the whole town. A few minutes later, investigators arrived on the country highway and thoroughly inspected the area. They confirmed that the package they found contained human remains. The package was sent for examination, and the searchers continued to comb the surrounding area. The recovered remains were soon identified. The victim was 24-year-old Cindy Loof. Sydney Irene Luff was born on August 21, 1993, in Broken Bow, Nebraska. She grew up in Arcadia with her parents George and Susie Luff. Sydney's family moved to Neely in 2000, at which time she was in second grade. Her mother Susie was a special education teacher, and her father George was the school principal. Sydney was always a very active child. The girl had a normal happy childhood filled with a love of nature. She loved fishing, which her father always took her to. During her school years, Cindy played basketball and golf, where she made good progress. But developed scoliosis, curvature of the spine, forced to give up many of her favorite hobbies and put a cross on her sports career. In 2011, after graduating from high school, Sydney got a job at a local Menard store that specialized in home improvement products. The Loofs were a close-knit family, and when Sydney had to move from Norfolk to Lincoln because of work, they all made sure to keep in touch almost every day and often met for dinner. Even though Sydney lived separately, she often returned home to her parents' house. But lately, Sydney had been struggling with depression and felt that the medications she was taking were only making things worse. Susie was very worried about her daughter and recommended a new doctor for her. He prescribed her various medications. In phone conversations with her mom, Sydney told how her inner state was getting back to normal, her voice sounding quite optimistic. She was trying to make some changes in her life and was looking for a new job. For a young woman, Working in a store was not the limit of her dreams. She did not know what she wanted to become or what to do with her career, and these worries led to a rather depressive state. In November 2017, her mental state deteriorated to the point where she started taking antidepressants and sometimes allowed herself to smoke pot. Her family and friends were supportive in every way possible, but she wanted not only companionship, but also love. Being young and modern, Sydney had an interest in the female gender, so she would sometimes look for other girls on social media for dating purposes. To find a friend, Sydney used Tinder, an app that allows millions of people around the world to find, fall in love, and date. In November 2017, she found a girl named Audrey, and the girl replied to her. They began to correspond. The girls found many common interests, such as gambling, hiking, and delicious food. Already after 100 messages, they decided to meet. On November 14th, Sydney headed over to Audrey's house to Wilbur. Their first meeting went so well that Sydney was very happy. They liked each other and agreed to meet again at Audrey's house. On November 15th, Sydney worked her shift at the store and went home. She cleaned herself up, 
styled her hair, and did her makeup. Before going out, she took a photo and posted it on Tinder with the caption, Ready for my date. After the photo, she got a message to go out, with Audrey waiting for her in the car. The girls drove off. The next day, Sydney Loof didn't show up for work. But even though she had been in high spirits for the past few days because of her new acquaintance, her family was concerned when co-workers informed them that she didn't show up for work because it was nothing like their responsible Sydney. Susie spoke of her daughter suffering from anxiety and deep depression. Just days before her disappearance, Loof had discussed her deteriorating mental health with her family, who advised her to see a doctor again to take antidepressants. That was the last time Loof's family saw Sydney. The girl's parents went to her apartment and were extremely surprised that Sydney had left her favorite cat Mimsy without food or water. This was extremely unlike a caring landlady. The parents knew how much Sydney loved her cat and never left her alone for long. They were concerned and reported Sydney missing to the police. The apartment itself was locked. When the police did a welfare check of Sydney's home, they saw nothing out of the ordinary. But the family was adamant. Something was wrong, and the police took their concerns seriously. On November 16, 2017, the five foot seven inch blonde was reported missing after she failed to show up at the showroom of the Menard store where she worked at 27th Street and Cornhusker Highway. Sydney suffered from a spinal condition and walked in a different way that would make her stand out from the crowd. She was wearing a white Columbia brand jacket and a cream-colored shirt. When testifying about the prior events before she went missing, her parents told police that she told her friend on Snapchat Wednesday morning that she had gone on a date with a woman she met online Tuesday night and planned to meet up with her again Wednesday night. Sydney's car, which she left in Northeast Lincoln, was found. Police officers said they have conducted interviews and were looking for any leads that could lead to Sydney or her trail. Loof's family distributed flyers saying she may have been abducted 40 miles southwest of Lincoln, where the latest information indicated her cell phone was communicating with a tower. The flyer also noted that there was no activity in her bank account and that her cell phone was turned off the night she disappeared. The flyers gave a description of the young woman and distinguishing features such as several tattoos. One on her arm with the words, everything will be great someday, a yin yang sign under her elbow and the word believe on her wrist. Anyone with information on Sydney Loof's whereabouts has been asked to contact police by phone. A huge appeal to find Sydney was launched, which included highway billboards with the girl's picture and a manhunt was also launched on the TV news. Susie persisted in claiming that something had happened to Sydney after the date her daughter had gone on. To prove her point, she took a screenshot of a post that Sydney posted on Snapchat with her picture and the caption, Ready for my date. Sydney's friends confirmed that she was going on a date with a woman she met through Tinder named Audrey. During the search, Police reviewed Sydney's phone records and surveillance footage from the store where she worked and quickly identified the person they wanted to talk to. The last time Sydney's phone rang a cell tower in the Wilbur neighborhood, probably not far from Audrey's home, but police had no idea who she was. Authorities began searching for a woman named Audrey, the last person to see Sydney alive, but no one knew how to find her because no one knew who she was or if she had a real name. To the police's rescue came Sydney's friend, Brooklyn, who decided to find Audrey herself through Tinder. She downloaded the app, found Audrey, and exchanged phone numbers with her. That's how police learned Audrey's real name. She turned out to be 26-year-old Bailey Boswell. It turned out that Bailey's apartment is within reach of the very cell tower where Sydney's phone was last seen connected to the tower. It also became known that this apartment Bailey shared with her partner, 52-year-old Aubrey Trail. So who are Bailey and Aubrey? Bailey Boswell grew up in Lyons, Iowa. She grew up in a wholesome, normal family, was a friendly kid, and did well in school. Bailey had success in basketball and was an excellent runner. However, after losing her father, her life changed direction, and after graduating from high school, Bailey went down the wrong path. Bad company, alcohol, and illicit drugs came into her life. 
On one of the dating websites, she met Aubrey after a looking for a daddy status. Aubrey Trail had a depressing past. He had multiple fraud charges, fraudulent check fraud, and theft. Aubrey created his own cult where he called himself the Vampire Daddy. He paid women $200 a week to follow his rules. The rules were strange enough, but there were women who believed Aubrey. At the time of Sydney's disappearance, Aubrey and Bailey were ordered by the court to pay over $400,000 for fraud. They also had numerous misdemeanors on the two of them, but the couple managed to go on the run. On November 19th, 2017, after obtaining a warrant, police searched Bailey and Aubrey's home. An inspection of the apartment revealed that some of the walls had been scrubbed with bleach, which was confirmed by a neighbor who had noticed the acrid smell of chlorinated substances two days earlier. Police actively began searching for the suspects. While on the run, they posted videos on Facebook saying they had no involvement in Sydney's disappearance and hoped for her safe return. Bailey claimed she went on two dates with Sydney, but dropped her off at a friend's house and never heard from her again. She said, I just want Sydney's family to know that I'm really sorry, but I had nothing to do with it. I hope Sydney is found very soon. She's a lovely, amazing girl. It took police a few days to track down the couple, but they eventually found them at a hotel in Branson, Missouri. Bailey Boswell and Aubrey Trail were taken into custody. A few weeks after Sydney was reported missing, after carefully analyzing phone records and Bailey's location records, police discovered Sydney's remains. She had been dismembered, her body had been cut into 14 pieces, and police found 13 of her body parts in black plastic garbage bags in ditches in Clay County. Some of her organs, including her heart, were missing. This is just horrific. A total of 16 crime scenes were found with Sydney's remains or personal belongings. Her car keys, driver's license, phone case were found along the highway. All the routes matched the movements of the two perpetrators. Forensics conducted autopsies on 13 body parts that were found. There were abrasions on Sydney's wrists, a bump on her head, torn earlobes, abrasions and contusions on her back. There were wounds on her body indicating that Sydney had fought for her life. The heartbreaking discovery shocked not only Sydney Loof's family and friends, but all of Nebraska. On December 11, 2017, the Loof family held a private funeral for Sydney at the Lutheran Church the girl attended during her lifetime. Bailey and Aubrey were charged with first-degree murder, improper disposal of human remains, and conspiracy to commit a felony. Bailey pleaded not guilty to all three charges. Aubrey also pleaded not guilty to felony murder and conspiracy, but pleaded guilty to improper disposal of human remains. Each successive deposition of Aubrey differed from the previous one. The man was constantly confused, changing the course of action and adding different actors. When Aubrey first talked to the police after his arrest, he told them about the cult he and Bailey were involved in. He talked about witchcraft and told them that he was a vampire who could fly. Aubrey portrayed himself as the leader of this cult and a vampire, and assured them that he had witches in the cult who had to kill another woman to get powers. So at one of his first court hearings, he admitted that he killed Sidney Loof, but did it completely by accident. He said that he paid her $5,000 to fulfill his intimate fantasy with two other women. Sidney agreed, but died accidentally during the intimate act when he accidentally strangled her with a cord. He also admitted that he disposed of the body by cutting her into pieces, as it was a ritual in accordance with his religious beliefs. He had to drain all the blood to release her soul to the gods in a sacred place and lay out her body parts to help her reincarnate faster. But this version turned out to be false. Surveillance footage provided, dated November 14th, shows Bailey and Aubrey checking into a hotel in Lincoln, not far from where Sydney lives. And then, on November 15th, they visit a home improvement store, which shows them buying a gruesome array of tools, a hacksaw, chlorine bleach, a folding saw, a stationary knife, and the bags used for Sydney's remains. On November 15th at 12.01 in the afternoon, a surveillance camera captured Sydney crossing paths with Aubrey at the Menard store during business hours. 
but the girl had no idea at the time who he was or how cruelly fate would play her. On June 11, 2018, the first court hearing was held for the murder and improper burial of Sidney Loof's remains. Separate trials were ordered, but the charge was essentially the same for both. The trials were held in Lexington because attorneys argued that Bailey and Aubrey would not get a fair trial in Wilbur because of the publicity surrounding the case. The prosecution argued that Sidney was murdered, she was strangled, and the crime was a premeditated attack that was carefully planned. Aubrey and Bailey were declared ringleaders of a group that was interested in recruiting young women for intimate games. Bailey therefore used Tinder to find the women. At trial, the jury heard testimony from three other women who said they had been in relationships with Aubrey and Bailey at different times, and their acquaintance also began on Tinder. All of them had been involved with Bailey and had participated in intimate acts with Bailey and Aubrey. One woman said she even traveled with them after they met. She said Aubrey gave her a weekly allowance of $200 and invited her to join his cult. He called the cult members witches and said she had to torture and kill someone to join them. She testified that Bailey was called a witch queen. Another woman testified that Bailey talked in great detail about breaking her fingers and her desire to dismember the body. She liked to talk about torture. All three women who testified made it clear that both Bailey and Aubrey were involved in all the talk about torture and the crime. It is quite strange that in our modern world, there are still people who believe in the horrors of exorcism and try to assure the rest of us that they do. Talking about the investigation and the evidence obtained, the prosecution reconstructed the picture of what happened on the tragic evening of November 15, 2017. Sydney was getting ready for a date with a woman she had known for a couple days. They texted on Tinder and Bailey picked Sydney up from her apartment. They went for a ride in Bailey's car. After a while, the car stopped at Bailey's house, where Sydney was lured into the apartment. There, Bailey and Aubrey pounced on her as soon as she went inside and strangled her with an extension cord on the living room floor. The apartment was then thoroughly cleaned out by Bailey and Aubrey, a part the prosecution alleged was also pre-planned. They then cut Sydney into pieces and dumped her remains in Clay County the next day, November 16th. The court heard from their landlord, Jennifer Call, who testified that on November 16th, as soon as she drove into the garage, she smelled chlorine and the odor intensified when she entered the house. According to the medical examiner's testimony, Sydney's death was ruled a homicide and the cause of death was asphyxiation. Toxicology reports indicated that Sydney had antidepressants in her system. The court learned that in addition to the missing organs, the part of Sydney's body that was not found was her upper left arm, the part just above the elbow and below the shoulder. Prosecutors had demanded the death penalty for both criminals and the case would be retried if the sentence was unjust. But Aubrey, once again, denied involvement in the occult and pleaded guilty only to improperly burying the remains. At one point during Aubrey's trial, he shouted that Bailey had nothing to do with Sidney's death. Bailey is innocent, damn you all. He then slashed his throat three times with a razor blade. He survived and was remanded into custody until he made a full recovery. After that, he did not attend court for several weeks. The next time he entered the courtroom was during the defense phase and only when he was scheduled to testify. When he was brought into court, he smirked and told the judge, I'll be good. It is unusual for a defendant to testify at his own trial. Usually, defense attorneys advise the defendant not to testify because it may cause more problems for him on cross-examination. Some reveal too much, some can't answer questions straightforwardly, and some are hostile to attorneys asking questions, which creates a bad impression for jurors. But this was not unusual in Aubrey's case, as he had many interactions with police after his arrest. He had given the police his version of events, and at trial, he wanted to change his story. Therefore, the court needed to hear his new version of events. He decided to skip the rest of the trial and only returned for the last hearing with his horrible scars clearly visible when he testified in his defense. Aubrey Trail took the stand and shocked his attorneys by admitting that he had previously lied to authorities and his own legal team 
about the death of Sidney Loof. In a new version of the testimony he gave, he admitted that they met with Sidney in March 2017 and he paid her to participate in his illegal activities because she needed the money. He said they did not keep in touch, but in November 2017, Bailey wanted to rekindle the relationship and she contacted Sidney again. Sidney needed money and Aubrey said that's why he was in Menards that day, November 15th. He offered her $5,000 to be part of his antique gang. The three of them ended up engaging in an intimate act later that night, and Sidney accidentally choked to death because of the extension cord they used in their games. I don't know if Sidney had a seizure or something, but that's when she stopped breathing, said Aubrey. He told the court that there was no ritual involved in cutting up Sidney's body and all the talk of witches, vampires, and blood-sucking was simply not true. He confessed that he only dismembered her because he couldn't put her body in the car. He said he panicked and dumped her body in a Clay County field as soon as dawn broke on the morning of November 16th. When asked why he didn't seek help if her death was accidental, he said no one would believe him. Aubrey admitted to disposing of Sidney's body, but claimed her death was accidental when they used an extension cord during their games. At Bailey's trial, she admitted to nothing. In fact, her attorneys argued that she was also victimized by Aubrey. Her attorney told the court that when she met Aubrey, she was a vulnerable young woman. At the time, she was living alone, working as a waitress in Princeton, Missouri. The defense argued that Bailey had nothing to do with either Sidney's death or the disposition of her remains, but that again proved to be false. The cell phone that Bailey used to access her Tinder account was used near where Sidney's body parts were found, and it was through a detailed analysis of her phone and location records that the police were able to find all of Sidney's remains. The court also learned that it was Bailey who contacted Sidney and arranged to meet her. She was the one who drove to Sidney's duplex to pick her up on the evening of November 15th. The prosecution told the court that Bailey derived satisfaction from discussing acts of cruelty and she enjoyed talking about torture with Aubrey. Evidence was presented at trial proving a planned crime. On the day Sidney was killed, Aubrey and Bailey were together at a store where they bought tools, including a hacksaw, scissors, and a box cutter from Home Depot. Around noon that day, Bailey sent Sidney a text message asking how her day was going. Phone records and surveillance footage show that Bailey was in the Menards parking lot with Aubrey when she sent that text message on Tinder. And although Sidney worked at Menards, it appears she was unaware that Bailey was there. A few hours later, Bailey sent Sidney another message on Tinder, alerting her that she was at her apartment and ready to pick her up soon. Phone records indicate that instead of going on a date, as Sidney believed, they went to the apartment where Bailey and Aubrey lived. Bailey's attorney, Todd Lancaster, argued that as to Bailey, the evidence showed that Bailey was guilty of purchasing bleach and garbage bags to use to dispose of Sidney's body, and as such, she could be charged with aiding and abetting the improper disposal of human remains. On November 8, 2021, Bailey Boswell was sentenced to life in prison. The Loof family had been seeking justice for three years, mourning and longing for their Sydney, and they awaited a judgment that gave them comfort. On July 11, 2019, it took a jury less than three hours to find Aubrey Trail guilty of premeditated conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and improper burial of human remains. The three-judge panel called his crime cold and calculated. In a second phase of the trial to determine whether he should be executed, county prosecutors kept their promise and secured the death penalty for Aubrey Trail. Thus, on June 9, 2021, Aubrey Trail was executed by lethal injection. The con man, accused of a brutal crime against Nebraska woman Sidney Loof, allegedly convinced members of his cult that he was a flying, mind-reading vampire with a coven of a dozen witches who he claimed would get their powers by killing people. But thankfully, in real-life stories, justice prevails, and in our story, the trial brought the monster to the end of his trail in our world. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you.